Support for Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and the following message come from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans with award-winning service throughout the home buying process at rocketmortgage.com slash wait. Equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLS. Consumeraccess.org. Number 3030. From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. Take me to the beach and toss me around. I'm your Frizzbill. <laughs> Bill Curtis. And here's your host at the Chase Bank Auditorium in Chicago, Peter Sagal. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Ah, it is summer. A time to reflect, take a break, and think about where we've been. How nice will it be in a few years when we get to do that all the time, because every season will be summer. (laughs) Today we're taking it easy and listening back to some of our favorite moments from earlier this year. There once was a time when I was merely a legendary anchorman, but I'm so much more than that now. Listen up. (laughs) From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. Sorry, Mitch McConnell, nobody blocks this bill. (laughs) Forget the infinity stones. Listen to my infinity tones. Lay me down for a triple word score. I'm Scrabble (laughs) Curtis. Is it hot in here? I blame Glow Bill Warming. (laughs) Sleep tight, baby. You're about to get a dose of (laughs) Bilitonin. Hey there, Georgia. I'll take a bite of your juicy peach. Some people need no introduction, although we always introduce them anyway. When we went to St. Louis in May of this year, Peter got to tell the good people of that city that they were off to see the Wizard of Oz. Everybody in St. Louis loves the Cardinals, and there is no Cardinal more beloved than Hall of Famer Ozzie Smith. (laughs) Winner! Of 13 Gold Glove Awards, acclaimed as the best shortstop ever to play the game and known around these parts as the Wizard of Oz or simply the Wizard. Go crazy, St. Louis. It's Ozzie Smith. Now, Ozzie, you came here to St. Louis to join us from where you live now that you're retired, which is... Right here. You live here in St. Louis. <laughs> yes. Right. So, you, so you, you retired from the game uh, back in the 90s, but you've, you've never left St. Louis? You stayed never here? left it. Uh, yeah. And this is why. I know. Well, wow. <laughs> why would I leave? I always wondered about that because there's a, there's a kind of cliche in sports that when somebody, uh, you know, does something amazing for the local team, like, say, hits a homer to win the National League uh, championship, uh, they say, that guy will never pay for a beer in this town again. So is it true that you can't pay for your own beer in this town again? True. All right. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you, go, I mean, you, you just walk into any bar and just say, you know, I'll have a beer and just wait. Just stand there. Just stand there. <laughs> yeah, just stand there. Yeah. But do, do you get recognized when you walk around town? I do. do you, I never have to wait in line for dinner either. I bet not. Do you still follow the game? I, I, sometimes I understand that oh, retired players, they can't enjoy it because they're not playing anymore. Um, yes, I follow the game. I go to spring training, yep. and I usually go when the pitchers and catchers report. Yeah. Uh, I, I visit with the guys for like 10 days, and then um, when they start playing games, I get out of there, and that way I can't get blamed. Do, do, you do, any, like, <laughs> do you do any like instruction to the shortstops? You're like, well, all you need to do is leap 30 feet sideways, Sorry. get the ball, jump 10 feet over oh the head <laughs> of the guy coming into second base and throw it to first. Try that. No, I... <laughs> Do, 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 do they come up to you and ask questions, the shortstops yes. who are playing the game? What kind of questions do they ask you? They ask, um, well, how do you get into the flow of it? You know, and the one thing that I always ex- explain to people, and, and we learned this in physics, you know, what's in motion stays in motion. Right. So the one thing that you don't want to do, as a, especially as a middle infielder, is be stagnated. Yeah. There has to be some type of movement that allows you to go left or right. And, and that, that probably is the one thing 
that when I talk to her or when I try and teach a guy is to have some type of movement because that's what allows you to get into the flow of Right, of, you're just of, sort of moving, you're liquid, you're ready to go. That's right. Absolutely, yeah. Never flat-footed. It's interesting because you mentioned, you know, the laws of physics because I was watching some of your highlights and that was physically impossible, half of what I saw. <laughs> yeah. It just couldn't be done. And I, I always ask this question of, of elite athletes like yourself. How young were you when you knew that you were good at this? Well, you know, I don't know if you ever really know exactly when that moment is, but when I was a kid, I used to lay on the floor and throw the ball up to get to feel a little, the ball hitting my hand without, without seeing it. I'd close my eyes and, and hit it and got hit in the head a couple times. Yeah, well, that'll happen. <laughs> that, that's part of it. But I also used to, um, we had a peak roof. I used to throw the ball up on, on one side of the roof. Yeah. And run around to the other side. Wow. In hopes yeah. of catching it before it hit the ground. Right. And people are sitting here wondering now. Yeah. Did you mm. ever get there? Did you ever Did get you there? do it? I never did. You <laughs> never did it. I, I never did, but it was that type of determination yeah. that made me the player that I became. Oh, I understand. Because <laughs> I'm gonna say, again. Watching you play, it just seems pure magic. It just seems like natural ability that you could leap well, up in the air, both feet, three feet off the ground, and, and peg the first baseman without hardly looking. Now let me say this here. It's like Bill. I'm standing back there, and I'm yeah. listening to him talk. Yeah. Bill, did you just, you just talk, don't you? I just talk. It's just natural. It's just natural. It, it, just, it just comes it out. Just comes. It's a gift. And, and it's, it's a, a gift. gift. I'm sure yeah. it's yours a, is. It's a gift, you know? So what you do with the gift is you... You try and maintain it as long as you can. Yeah. And you try and share it with as many people as you possibly can and uh, never take anything for granted. That's absolutely true. <laughs> I, I just want to say, uh, just growing up in Chicago, watching you on WGN Channel 9, <clears throat> I was always amazed on how you were just so cool 24-7 even right now, you're like the coolest dude in this whole theater. <laughs> and yet, it's, how, I mean, help me understand. Help me be a better person. How do you keep that level of cool but still compete at that intensity? Uh, Brian, you know what? It, you just, just be yourself, you know? Uh, okay. W when you're amongst friends, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. I'm, in the, I'm amongst about 35, 4,000 friends. If I was just being myself with a 230-pound guy barreling toward me, <laughs> trying to kill me with his feet, I would pee my pants. That would be my legitimate, honest being myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never, never let them see you sweat. Well, Ozzy Smith, we've invited you here to play a game that this time we're calling... We're off to see the wizard. Oh, no. You were known when you played as the Wizard of Oz or just the wizard for your magical plays at shortstop. So we thought we'd ask you about the original Wizard of Oz, the classic 1939 movie. Answer two out of three questions correctly, you'll win our prize for one of our listeners, the voice of their choice in their voicemail. Bill, who is the great Ozzy Smith playing for? Drew Richardson of St. Louis, Missouri. All right. Ready to do this? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. All right. First question, people say they don't make them like they used to, and it's true, The Wizard of Oz is proof of that. Which of these is a real reason that The Wizard of Oz, as it was made, could not be made today? A, the actors who played the munchkins were all paid a fraction of regular wages due to an old pay-by-height rule. <laughs> B, the Wicked Witch's broomstick, the Scarecrow's outfit, and all of the fake snow were made of asbestos. Or C, the 1994 Religious Freedom Act, which prevents witches or Wiccans from being presented in a negative light. Oh, let's see. You're going to go for C. Yes. Well, can I tell an anecdote? You may yes. tell Related. an anecdote. Okay, so I read that, you know, the Tin Man with all the silver, yes. that that makeup was so toxic that it sent the original actor to the hospital. So it's B. So it's B. So it's B. All right. We got an assist for Amy. It is, in fact, B. B, okay. You got an assist? Woo! I you fed it. him. You I'm fed him, as yeah. you say in right. baseball. Good Very good. Feet. Good feet. Yeah, it's, it was the asbestos. Like, remember all that scene in the poppy field where they're all sleeping and all the oh, snow God. falls on their faces and wakes uh, them up? That was asbestos? Pure poison, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. All right, next question. The Wizard of Oz has been, of course, a pop culture treasure since its release in 39. Sometimes things from the movie pop up in unexpected places, as in which of these... A, after Margaret Thatcher died in 2013, the song Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead re-entered the British music charts at number two. 
B, Popeye's restaurant once offered something called the Gizzard of Oz. <laughs> or C, Garth Brooks' 2003 Man Behind the Curtain tour in which he sang his entire set in a booming voice from behind a curtain just like the wizard did. A? They, they say A, but what do you say? I say A. You're right, that's what happened. <laughs> All right. Let's see if you can be as perfect in this as you were in just about everything else. <laughs> There was a fair amount of acrimony on the set of Wizard of Oz, with a lot of the hate focused on one of the performers. Who was it? Was it A, Scarecrow actor Ray Bolger, who walked around the set saying, actually, I'm very smart, and mansplaining everything? <laughs> B, Vladimir Oskoff, a Russian method actor who played the lead flying monkey and, well, decided to act like a monkey on the set, if you know what I mean? Or C, Terry, who played Toto, the dog, who was paid more per week than most of the human actors he worked with. Was Toto paid? Pay? Lassie was paid? Tim That's Tim, right. Rin Tim right. was paid. Rin Tim, Tim was the hey biggest man, dog, paid star. C. Paid. You're right, it was C. <laughs> Terry the dog, who played Toto, brought down like 150 bucks a week, which at the time was the equivalent to about $2,000 today. Wow. So he was a well-paid pup. Bill, was Ozzy as perfect as he was here as he was on the that field? That is a great score, Ozzy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you zipped it. Add that, to, <laughs> add that to your lifetime stats. Carve that in your plaque in the Hall of Fame. Ozzy Smith. Thank you. Remember the Baseball Hall of Fame. The Cardinals legend. President of the Gateway PGA Reach Foundation. Their 10th annual gala and golf tournament is September 22nd and 21st. Ozzy Smith, the greatest shortstop who ever played. Thank you so much for being with us. When we come back, you'll hear our panelists as you've never heard from them before because you weren't supposed to hear it. And Anna Kendrick, star of Pitch Perfect, picks a peck of pickled peppers. We'll be back in a minute with more of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from MailChimp. So you want to grow your business? Now what? MailChimp's all-in-one marketing platform, that's what. It has all the marketing stuff you need all in one place so you can save time and money. And it's powered by a marketing CRM so you can collect, organize, and understand your audience data. All to help you market smarter and grow faster. Learn more at MailChimp.com. I'm Shankar Vedantam, host of NPR's Hidden Brain. Think deeply. Here to tell you about our summer series, U2.0. Ideas and advice about how you can respond to life's chaos. Let's do it. Just check to my inbox. Just check. Just check. Just check to my phone real quick. With wisdom. Listen to Hidden Brain every week. From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. I'm Bill Curtis, and here is your host at the Chase Bank Auditorium in Chicago, Peter Sagal. Thank you, Bill. So, so we've got something special for you right now. Now, when we get together to do our show, we always spend a little time before the show begins to just chat with the audience. It's just a little time, you know, warming up, not for air, until now. If you've ever wondered what we talk about when we think you're not listening well, listen now. I don't want to take up too much time, but, but Paula had an amazing story because you flew here to Chicago, not to do our show, but to get a puppy. I flew you, here to oh. get a puppy two weeks ago, out, just outside of Chicago. It was a, uh, it's a, uh, gold, it's, uh, a golden retriever Newfoundland mix. And it was at a rescue place outside of Chicago. And, uh, but I flew in on that day where you guys had the huge snowstorm. And so me and the puppy were stuck in the airport for 24 hours. It outgrew the carrier while we were there. So you've been stuck. I don't know if you've ever been stuck in her hair. She was stuck there with a puppy. Yeah. That yeah. was crazy. But it was, it was good. There was something about it. Like when I was back in her hair today, I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember. It's like your home now. Yeah, yeah. I, I stood in line right here for four hours. Yeah, <laughs> with a puppy. And Alonzo, you were talking about the fact that you've been getting sort of public radio people coming to your stand-up show. Yeah, I get, uh, I get NPR people who are coming to the show. And they're fun. They are nice. Like Tom says, they're nice. I can always tell them because they're the ones that, ooh. <laughs> 
you know, because I, I say a few things that I might not say here. And then I'm also on, I'm on Comedy Central's show, The New Negroes. Ah. So the NPR crowd can't say the title of that show <laughs> without... <laughs> Earlier this year, we learned that the Boston accent is considered one of the sexiest accents, and while that was surprising and somewhat unsettling, oh, be quiet. It did give us a chance to call up an old friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Ray Maliazzi of Car Talk. Hey, Ray. Ray, how are you? I'm very well. You folks are having a lot of fun making fun of my peeps. Yeah, we are. <laughs> you, we do it all the time. Usually we don't let you listen. So the question for you, Ray, is uh, have you in your life of having a Boston accent, have you found it to be very sexy? Has it had that effect on the people you'd want it to have that effect on? I think it worked for my brother for many years. I mean, think of all the wives and girlfriends he had. Yeah, and nobody true. had a worse boss of accent than he. <laughs> that that he is true. true. But, was he, but, but were his wives and girlfriends also with the Boston accent? Not all, no, no, not all of them. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I think he was a genuine charmer. I think it might have been the accent. It always took him so far, though. You know, they eventually saw through him and they got rid of him. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so, as a kind of test, uh, Ray, we uh -huh. have decided that we've asked you to read a couple of romantic lines <laughs> from movies. I can tell I'm not going to like this, but no, go no, ahead. No. And so, uh, do, do you have those with you? We sent those to you. No, you didn't send me anything. Ah. Oh. <laughs> uh, should I have received like a text message or something? You, that you, you, should, you should have received an email about three hours ago, but. Uh, I, uh, Oh, I haven't checked my email for two days. So. <laughs> I'll just read him to you. You say him back to me in your, in your most charming, sexy Boston accent. Ready? I will do my best. All right, here we go. Ready? So we're just going to start with this one. How about this? The heart knows what the heart wants. Oh, so you want me to say... I do. The, heart, the heart knows what the heart wants. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's getting hot in here. Helen is flush. All right. How about this one? I wish I knew how to quit you. I wish I knew how to quit you. <laughs> Not a lot of big difference there. All right, we'll move on. How about this? Draw me like one of your French girls, Jack. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Draw me like one of your French girls. That? Is that what it is? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's good. That's okay. good. Last one. Last one. Ready? My tastes are very... Singular. Oh, my tastes are very singular. <laughs> Smoldering. You know what that was? That was Fifty Shades of Ray. <laughs> Ray Maliazzi, everybody, from Caritas. Great to talk to you, Ray. See you later. Bye-bye. Right now, panel, some more questions for you from the week's news. Helen. Yes. Gwyneth Paltrow is expanding her goop empire. Ugh. <laughs> Stop. Gwyneth. She's Gwyneth. At, she's adding a new section of her website offering products and advice to whom? Um, is it men? Yes, it oh. is men. Oh. We all know Gwyneth Paltrow has this empire called Goop, which offers all these wonderful things for women. Well, now Ms. Paltrow has launched Goop Men, featuring a men's clothing line and male-focused articles, such as what to do about low testosterone and how to have difficult conversations with friends, like the one where you tell your friends you're getting lifestyle advice from Goop. <laughs> She gives the worst advice, and now she's trying to give the worst advice to more people. That's what she's doing. Didn't she at some point tell women to put, a, like, a thing in their vaginas? Do yes, that? and we men are very nervous about what she's going to tell us to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I, Jaquinef, just, you need a vacation. <laughs> no, the, the men's goop? Men's, men's goop. It's men's goop. It's men's goop. Ew. Gross. Gross. First of all, gross. I think yeah. it's actually called goop fellas. <laughs> <laughs> it has men's beauty projects like the $140 jar of replenishing night cream, 
which is the same exact night cream available in the women's store, but the men's version comes in a beer can. <laughs> <laughs> what is night cream? It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's it's like a it's a cream that you put on your face at night as, as part of your night ritual. And as a oh. millennial man, I have one. Oh are you, so do just, you really? yeah. Jordan, are you on Poop Fellows? I, yeah, I, I wrote it down. I was are like, Poop Fellows, I'm on. You know, I, I, yeah, I might. We just met today, and I said to myself, that man moisturizes. <laughs> <laughs> Cocoa butter, where are you at? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, not a black crowd. Got it. All right. Cool. <laughs> Didn't we warn you? <laughs> this, 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 this is basically get out without the murder. I mean, this is... <laughs> oh. Anna Kendrick first became famous as a star of the Twilight movies. It's amazing how much she's triumphed over that early adversity. Ms. Kendrick joined us in September of last year and told us that her origin story goes back much further than that. Yeah, I started in theater when I was, um, well, I started in local theater when I was like five or six. And then I did the play Annie, which is, you know, the gateway drug for all girls trying yes. to do theater. Then um, I wanted to audition for professional shows and um, my parents were gracious enough to drive me from Maine to New York City for these auditions and I was 12 and he was 14 and we got on a Greyhound bus and I auditioned for the musical High Society and um, eventually I got that. Wow. wow. So your, your parents said, we've had it. Here's a bus <laughs> ticket. Call us when you're famous. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember, what, were you Annie when you were a nanny in, uh, in local theater? No, I was Tessie, um, who said, you know, they're fighting and I won't get no sleep all night. You always remember your first line. Are you telling me that there is somebody who is probably still in this world who is walking around knowing that Anna Kendrick auditioned for their production of Annie and you did not get cast as Annie? Yeah, she's a real stuck-up bitch to this day. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? There's relief in that because they've done a study that shows that um, kids who play Annie often uh, become procrastinators. Well, good to know. I yeah. know because it's it's, it's always tomorrow. Things off till tomorrow. Exactly. exactly. So Musical I theater joke. You you uh, got I, away with that. I good I, for you. I mentioned this when I introduced you. I wanted to check it. Is you were doing you were working a lot as a professional actor in films. You played opposite George Clooney in Up in the Air and was nominated for an Oscar. But is it true that the the thing that really sort of propelled you was the Pitch Perfect movies? Yeah, I think that's true. That had a really wide audience, and as you say, like this thing really took off, which was me, you know, singing with a plastic cup. And when I, um, you know, when everybody was auditioning for that film, everybody kind of needed to sing just so that, you know, they, they knew that you could sing. And I knew how to do this kind of dorky thing with this cup and because I'd seen these two girls doing it on a YouTube video and I taught myself how to do it because I have too much free time on my hands and uh, so I said well I mean if I'm going to sing anyway I could show you this thing that I can do and they put it in the movie and then it you know became a single and they recorded it as a full song and made a music video for it so um, you know, learn geeky stuff because yeah. then you'll have a triple platinum song. Yeah, it's, it's, I, and I realized that when we spoke earlier and I called you, you were actually at that moment watching YouTube videos. You're looking for the next big gimmick, I guess. Oh, I was. That's right. Well, I was looking at skunk-related videos, so I'm not sure how that's going to help me. I'm sorry, did you say skunk-related videos? Yeah, it was, um, it was a video of a gang of skunks. <laughs> what, what, what were they doing? Well, uh, they were scurrying across the front lawn, and then they thought they heard something, and they all, like, gathered together and put up their tails, and I, like, almost started crying because, you know, they're these reviled little creatures, but they have each other's backs. <laughs> they were looking out for each other. Did they, did they, like, arrange themselves so, like, their scent glands were pointed in all directions? No, in case? actually, which seems like a design flaw. The people, the, the guys in the front um, really have it easy, but the, uh, <laughs> the privates in the back... Pitch Perfect, of course, if you haven't seen it, what is wrong with you, ladies and gentlemen? It is a movie about competitive a cappella singing, which is a real thing in this world. 
Um, has it? Unfortunately, yeah. No, I, I think it's pretty awesome. I actually do think it's really cool. It is great. And and did your movies? Because there have now been three of them. Did, have they led to uh, like an explosion or revival of acapella? Unfortunately, yes. Really? <laughs> so you've spent some time with real acapella groups. I actually didn't for research purposes. I actually had done before. Ooh. Um, so I went, a friend kind of dragged me to an acapella competition, and I thought it was going to be very dorky, and I ended up, by the end of it, I was like, do you think we could go backstage and meet them? <laughs> I wonder and like went to like a, a house party that they were throwing at their college and tried to get to know them because you know when you see somebody do something that is really impressive you know it doesn't matter if it's considered geeky you get really into it sure absolutely, yeah. absolutely. oh my god I made out with an acapella member uh, in college in my freshman yes, year and it was the, it was the best night of my life <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I wonder if ever, like, say at an a cappello competition, if anybody ever, like, whips out a guitar or a keyboard and just ruins it. Just get food? <laughs> then, yeah. how dare you? Yeah. Anyway, we, 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 uh, we wanted to do this with you just as a little sort of preliminary for the real quiz, which is we were looking around, and it turns out that a lot of a cappella groups have really odd names. So we wanted to yeah, ask. Yeah, they have puns. You, yeah, so we wanted to ask you if you could tell the real ones from the fake ones, and uh, just to see h how you do with this. Uh, so I'm just going to read some names. You tell me if you think they're real or not. Oh, I will have no idea, but absolutely. Okay, let's here do we go. It. Like, how about the tempo tantrums? <laughs> I I really want that to be real. It is Ohio University tempo tantrums. Wow. I love it. How about the rhythm method? <laughs> no. Clever, but if a college lets them get away with that, I would be surprised. So I'm gonna say that's not real. No, it is. It's it's a oh. big Indian university. A Amazing. couple more. Here's Proud one. Of them. Here's one. Uh, Sophie's voice. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Not real. Not real. No, not real. <laughs> <laughs> one last one. Rhythm and Jews. <laughs> oh. I love that. I hope that's real. Yes, it is. University of Chicago represents. <laughs> Well, Anna Kendrick, it is as delightful to talk to you as I always imagined it would be. And we have asked you here to play a game that we're calling... Pitching Perfectly. As we have discussed, you starred in the Pitch Perfect movie, so we thought we'd talk to you about pitching perfectly. Specifically, a no-hitter thrown by Pittsburgh Pirate pitcher Doc Ellis back in 1970. Answer oh, wow. two out of three questions about Doc Ellis's no-no, as they call it in the game, and you'll win our prize for one of our listeners, the voice of their choice on their voicemail. Bill, who is Anna Kendrick playing for? Shannon Durfee of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. Here's your first question. Doc Ellis walked eight batters that day. He hit one, but he still did not get up a hit in a nine-inning complete game. But what made his no-hitter so unique in the annals of baseball? Was it A, a right-handed pitcher, he threw this one with his left hand, quote, just for kicks. B, because of the walks, he actually lost the game, one to zero. Or C, he was high on LSD the whole time. Oh, I mean, I wish it was C, but I guess I'll say B. Can you, can you hear the shouts of all the middle-aged men listening to radio, the radio right now who are shouting no. the right answer? Can you, because they're all saying it was... C, yes, this is one of the famous games. Doc Ellis pitched a no-hitter on LSD. Oh, that's wow. fabulous. You still have two more chances here, so there's still a chance. Uh, as you can imagine, pitching in a major league game while tripping on LSD has its challenges. <laughs> Ellis said that during the game, he had to pitch around which of these problems, A, believing the catcher was Richard Nixon, <laughs> B, not being able to either feel or see either of his arms, or C, constantly resisting the urge to take a bite of the ball, which smelled like a hamburger. Ooh, um, is it A? It is A, yes. He, he says at one point he looked in, and Richard Nixon was behind the plate, and even worse, the batter was Jimi Hendrix, and he was swinging an electric guitar. All right, now, Doc Ellis, as you can imagine, did not limit his misbehavior to that one game. Later on in his career, in a game against the Cincinnati Reds, he attempted to do what? A, pitch underhanded, B, roll the ball to the plate, or C, hit with a pitch every single member of the opposing team. C. 
You are right, Anna. That's what we did. For reasons known perhaps only to him, he was angry at the Cincinnati Reds, so he decided to throw a ball and hit every single member of the opposing team. He hit three of them and then threw two balls over the heads of the next two, and he was then removed from the game. This guy sounds amazing. He was a pretty interesting fellow. Let me just say that about Doc Ellis. Bill, how did Anna Kendrick do in our quiz? What a winner. Two out of three, Anna. Good going. Congratulations. Anna Kendrick's new movie is a simple favor. It is out now. Anna Kendrick, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. When we come back, one of the greatest players and one of the greatest coaches of all time, each play Not My Job, one of the worst games of all time. We'll be back in a minute with more Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me from NPR. Support for Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and the following message comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Imagine how it feels to have an award-winning team of mortgage experts make the home buying process smoother for you. With a history of industry-leading online lending technology, Rocket Mortgage is changing the game. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash wait, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, mnlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Push button. Get mortgage. The U.S. women's soccer team just won its fourth World Cup, and it has been way more successful than the men's team. Yet, the women say they are paid less than half of what the male soccer players are, and now they are suing for equal pay. Find out more about this on The Indicator from NPR. From NPR and WBEC Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. I'm Bill Curtis, and here is your host at the Chase Bank Auditorium in Chicago, Peter Segal. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, everybody. Because we are public radio people, everybody assumes we're unathletic nerds and we aren't any good at sports. And they are, of course, right. But we are interested in talking to people who are good at them. In 2017, we ventured to San Francisco to talk to the greatest wide receiver of all time, Jerry Rice. Although he disagreed, uh, he thought he was the greatest player of all time. (laughs) But he didn't always see himself that way. Well, let's go back in time. I assume you were a a, a star athlete growing up, right? No, I was a nerd. Were you really? Yeah. I started playing football around my sophomore year in high school. Really? I'm somewhat comforted by that. When you say you were a nerd, (laughs) too late. Yeah, Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) I was. I, I was hoping you were going to say in your early 50s, then I'd be like, yes! But So when you say nerd, what do you mean? Very quiet. Really? But, but I had very large hands. Right. <laughs> and really skinny. So I would walk around with my hands in my pocket all the time because everybody would notice my hands before yeah. they noticed me. Wait a minute. So yeah. you're telling me that like you were embarrassed as a kid yeah. because your hands were so large. They were so big. And yeah. that ended up being the attribute that helped you become the greatest wide right. receiver of all time, a Hall of Famer. Right. You are the football equivalent of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, right? Uh, Everybody makes fun of him. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're like, they're like, Jerry, will you catch this football tonight? And you're like, I can do that. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> That is amazing. Can I tell you that I, too, have incredibly large hands? (laughs) Yeah. It takes more than that to be you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I got one last question, which is that that often the wide receivers line up uh, outside uh, toward toward, toward the sidelines, and you're often right across from the safety or cornerback who's going to be trying to cover you. Is th- what passes between you two guys as you're looking at him, he's looking at you, and you, he knows that he's going to try to stop you, and you know he's not going to. I mean, did you ever, did you ever like trash talk or just? No, I just look at the defensive back and I say, you done. <laughs> 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 All right, Jerry Rice, we've invited you here to play a game we're calling. Take a seat, Joe Montana. It's time for Hannah Montana. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about that. 
You formed one of the great offensive tandems with quarterback Joe Montana, so we thought we'd ask you about that other great Montana, Hannah. <laughs> You're looking at me with a look of confusion. Do you know who Hannah Montana was? I have heard the name. Yes. Hannah Montana, just so you know, was a fictional character played by the, on the Disney Channel by the very real Miley Cyrus. And it was a TV show about a, a young girl who had a normal life, but her other life was being a pop star named Hannah Montana. That was the plot of the show. So we're going to ask you three questions about that. And if you get two of them right, <laughs> you will win our prize. Are you one of serious? Them. I am absolutely serious. This is so funny because you were talking about your, your laser stare, your absolute confidence. You are now fidgeting in your chair looking for an exit. This is hilarious. That's what we're going to ask <laughs> it's getting hot up in here, guys. <laughs> Bill, who is Jerry Rice playing for? Luke McAvoy of San Francisco, wow. California. <laughs> Ready to do this? Let's do it. All right. When Disney was creating the show back then, they considered a bunch of names based on place names. Uh, you know, eventually, like Hannah Montana, they thought of a name Alexis Texas. Why couldn't it, they use that one? Mm. A, the state of Texas charges royalties for any commercial use of its name. B, cast member Moises Arias had a thick Castilian accent, and he pronounced it Alexis Texas. Mm. Or C, Alexis Texas is the name of a well-known adult film star. C. C. I am good. I am so good. Uh, yeah, it, it was C. Alexis Texas. They were afraid what would happen when kid fans of the show were to Google the name <laughs> Alexis Texas. So became Anna Montana. All right. So I got that one right. Yeah. You bet. You got that All one right. right. Yeah. Okay. All right, second question. Uh, the show Hannah Montana, which was a big hit, ran for some years, influenced many artists and performers, such as whom? A, actor Eli Roth, who listened to her music to prepare for his role as a stone-cold killer in the movie Inglorious Bastards because he said it made him feel insane. <laughs> B, performance artist Marina Abramovich, who after hearing one Hannah Montana song conceived of her piece, The Artist is Present, where she sat in silence for over 700 hours. <laughs> Or C, Lynn manuel Miranda, author and composer, who says Hannah's struggles as she tried to become famous inspired the early scenes as Alexander Hamilton <laughs> starts his climb to the top. Peter, you know I've been preparing myself for this all day. I bet you have. <laughs> Running up and down those hills. Uh, so, you guys are not going to help me out? <laughs> A, a, apparently. Yes, it's A. <laughs> Eli Roth, apparently listening to Hannah Montana, put him in the mood to beat people to death with a bat. All right. <laughs> Hannah Montana has a lot of dedicated fans, but some of them may surprise you, like which of these? A, Vice President Mike Pence, <laughs> who considers her music, quote, wholesome but danceable. <laughs> B, actor Stephen Baldwin, who has Hannah Montana's initials tattooed on his shoulder. Or C, artist Damien Hirst, who called his installation of a decomposing beef cow the real Hannah Montana. <laughs> <laughs> if we could weaponize the look of incredulity that Jerry Rice is giving me right now. Did you say number two? I said, I said, uh, I said Stephen Baldwin, the actor, uh, the answer wow. is that he got a tattoo of Hannah, HM, Hannah Montana's initials on his shoulder. He oh, was so inspired okay. by her. Such a All fan. Right. So I would say C. You're going to go see that Damien Hirst, the British conceptual artist, Damien Hirst fans put a decomposing cow in a thing and called it the real Hannah Montana. I wouldn't put it by him, but it was actually the tattoo. It was oh. Stephen Baldwin. <laughs> You'll be happy or sad to know that Mr. Baldwin now regrets the tattoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bill, how did Jerry Rice do in our show? His score was two out of three, and you're a winner. Thanks for winning. Jerry Rice is a Super Bowl MVP and three-time Super Bowl champ. Jerry recently partnered with the National Kidney Foundation to promote kidney health. Jerry Rice, thank you so much for joining us.
Support for this podcast is brought to you by Discover Card. You check things all the time, like your email or social media, but Discover asks, what about checking something as important as your credit score? Well, Discover makes it quick and easy with their credit scorecard, which is free for everyone, even if you're not a customer. See your FICO credit score and other important credit information, and once you know your score, you should check to see if your current credit card is the best fit for you. Learn more at discover.com slash credit scorecard. Limitations apply. Support also comes from Tapestry Collection by Hilton, which dares to be original. From a converted warehouse that's now home to the Cotton Sale Hotel in Savannah, Georgia, to the hidden speakeasy beneath the Graham Hotel in Washington, D.C., each of their hotels embraces its neighborhood vibe for a truly original experience. So when you're looking for an authentic approach to the local scene, stay in a Tapestry Collection by Hilton Hotel that's as unique as you are. Visit Hilton.com slash wait, wait. Now, what would a great player be without a great coach? Well, according to at least one of them, they'd still be great players. Coach Mike D'Antoni of the Houston Rockets joined us in January of this year, and we asked him about working with the superstar on his team. Um, what's it like getting to watch James Harden play every night? Ah, uh, special. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's the real deal. Yeah. And it's... Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's better than what most people think. He's, he's the best I've seen. For people who don't know, James Harden is known for his extraordinary offensive play and also for his amazing beard. Yeah. Have you ever had to talk to him about the beard? Like, dude, nobody can see your uniform number. You need to... No, most of the time it's like, you know, you got egg in there or you got... <laughs> you, is, is part of your duties as head coach like yeah. picking the nits out of James Harden's beard? Sometimes that's my only duty. <laughs> He seems pretty serious. Are you allowed to tease him about his beard? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, when did you figure out that you could be a coach in this league? When I'm 39 years old and I retire from playing and I'm looking around and going, now what? And so it's like, you know, I had really good teams in Europe and I got lucky. And uh, like anybody else, is just being in the right spot at the right time and... Uh, went back and started coaching the NBA. Do you have, like, psychological uh, techniques that you use? (laughs) No, no, no. That would mean that I would have to be, and the players have to be smart, so we're not, no, we're just playing ball. Coach, you're known for a really up-tempo style. Do players like playing for you because of that, or is it exhausting for them? (laughs) No, no, it's, I think they like it. Um... There's been some that haven't liked it, and obviously I've been to different cities. I've been fired a few times, so there's a lot of players don't like that. No, no. They don't like being fired, or they don't like when you get fired? No, they get me fired. Oh, I so, see. Obviously, they didn't like to play that, the way I wanted to play. Well, that, that to me is interesting because you're coaching incredibly well-paid, incredibly talented athletes who have been at the pinnacle of their sport for probably their entire careers. Like, everybody in the NBA was a superstar until the moment they got there. Yeah. How do you handle people like that, who are the stars of the league? Well, there's a lot of groveling and begging and, <laughs> and pleading. Well, right. I think, then, that you need to have some psychological techniques. There you go. <laughs> so, so seriously, how do you, if, if James Harden, say, or, or Chris Paul, both superstars, if, if you want them to do something they're not doing, or you want them to do something better or different, how do you do that? We work together, and uh, I get my experience in there, and we, we're very analytic-based now, so a lot of it is data-driven, where they can see that it makes sense. Right. Give me an example of a time where a problem is solved by data. Well, you'd have a player that shoots primarily uh, two-point shots instead of three-point shots. I mean, I'm not going to get too technical, but... Uh, I can show them some of the data that shooting that shot there is not as effective as shooting the three points. So you have to Wait change a minute. your game. But, uh-huh. but they don't know that three points is well, higher than two points. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's taken, about 20, it's taken about 20 years for the NBA to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait Coach, a minute. Coach um, uh, I'm on a, a YMCA men's team in <laughs> Bellingham, Washington. Good. Yeah, we're well, called you want to go for the three points. Start. Yeah, we're called the Sledgehogs. You've probably heard of us. Yeah. I didn't name the team. We um, have scouts there most of the night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we lost a game this week by 49 points. <laughs> Do you have any any advice for us as how to be a better team? <laughs> yeah, well, 
start scoring more points with that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's three points more than two points. <laughs> yeah, three. Okay. Two the, threes. The biggest cliche of every sports movie any of us have ever seen is, is the halftime motivational speech, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Do you give so, that? Do you, no. <laughs> really? Most of the time, I'm, like I said, I'm in that fetal position. They're giving me the speech. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well... Coach, it is great to have you with us. We have invited you here today to play our game, and we call it... Mike D'Antoni. Meet Mike Dan and Tony. Since you your name is built out of three first names, much like a Transformer, Mike, <laughs> Dan, and Tony, right. we thought we'd ask you one question each about a Mike, a Dan, <laughs> and a Tony. All right. If you get two right, could be a Dan and Mike, could be a Tony and Dan, could be a Tony and Mike... If you do any of those, you'll win our prize for one of our listeners, the voice of their choice from our show. Jokey, who is Coach Mike D'Antoni playing for? Jim Hogan of Geneva, New York. Are right, you ready to play? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. First up, uh, Michael Jordan, you may have heard of him. He remains the world's most famous Mike. He was so famous during his heyday that you could find which of these? A, a shrine to him in the palace of North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il. B, a megachurch in Lebanon that believed he was the Messiah or C, the Be Like Mike diet book, which recommended you consume only Gatorade and expensive cigars. <laughs> I'm probably going with the shrine in North Korea just because Ro Dennis Rodman solved our problems there, right? You're right. You're exactly right. It turns out that uh, Kim Jong-un got his love of the great Bulls teams of yesteryear yeah. from his father, Kim Jong-il. So Kim Jong-il, the dictator, had a shrine to Michael Jordan. All right, next up is Dan. One of the most famous Dans in American history was Vice President Dan Quayle. <laughs> He's remembered now mostly for misspelling the word potato and for not being Jack Kennedy, but... He also said many memorable things during his time in the public light, including which of these? A, quote, I have made good judgments in the past. I have made good judgments in the future. <laughs> B, quote, I believe we are on an irreversible trend towards more freedom and democracy, but that could change. <laughs> Or C, quote, the Holocaust was an obscene period in our nation's history. No, not our nation's, but in World War II. I mean, we all lived in this century. I didn't live in this century, but in this century's history, unquote. Now, do you have D, all of the above? Uh, that's actually right. I'm going to give it to you. He said all of those things. Uh, the last up is Tony. So one of the most famous Tonys, of course, is Tony the Tiger. <laughs> Tony the Tiger, the serial spokes animal, has fans around the world. They can get a little out of hand, though, such as when which of these actually happened. A, a group of people started raising money to save tigers from, they said, being harvested to make frosted flakes. <laughs> B, Tony the Tiger went on Twitter to ask furries to please stop sending him anthropomorphic erotica. <laughs> or C, somebody invented a language called Tony Talk, which is English, but you growl every R. I'm going with B. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right, coach. <laughs> this happened a couple years ago. A lot of people were tweeting inappropriate things at Tony the Tiger, so he tweeted, quote, I'm all for showing your stripes, feathers, etc., but let's keep things great and family friendly. If you could, Cubs could be watching. <laughs> Jokey, how did Coach Mike D'Antoni do in our quiz? Nothing but net. Mike got three out of three. Congratulations, Coach. Mike D'Antoni is coach of the Houston Rockets. Coach Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for our special Midsummer Break Edition. Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is a production of NPR and WBEZ Chicago in association with Urgent Haircut Productions, Doug Berman, Benevolent Overlord. Philip Godica writes our limericks. Our public address announcer is Paul Friedman. Our house manager is Tyler Green, assisted by Simon Tran. Our interns are Panina Beattie and Lila Francis. Our web guru is Beth Novi. B.J. Lederman composed our theme. Our program is produced by Jennifer Mills, Miles Durham, Boston, Lillian King. Technical directions from Lorna White. 
Our business and ops manager is Colin Miller. Our production coordinator is Robert Newhouse. Our senior producer is Ian Chillog. And the executive producer of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is Mike Danforth. Thanks to Bill Curtis, all of our panelists, all of our special guests. And, of course, thanks to you for listening. I am Peter Sagal, and we'll see you next week. This is NPR.